Okay. There we go. There's Chris. <laughs> hey, everybody. So we have Chris today who will be presenting today on updating low water datums in the Great Lakes. And just to give a little bit of a background uh, on Chris, uh, Chris has worked with NOAA's Center for Operational Oceanographic Products and Services for, is it over 25 years now, Chris or so? Um, and right. so he's, he's definitely covered uh, quite a bit in regards to water levels and extreme water levels. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to you, Chris. Take it away. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I hope the mic works all right. We hear you loud and clear. Um, okay, updating low water datum in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes low water datum is an important reference level used for safe waterway navigation and harbor infrastructure development. Nautical charts in the Great Lakes are referenced to the low water datum. Our interagency group has been tasked by the Vertical Control Water Level Subcommittee of the Coordinating Committee on Great Lakes Basic Hydraulic and Hydrologic Data to carry out an investigation of the currently existing datum in the lakes. <clears throat> the results will be used to determine whether there exists a need to adjust the low water datum when the planned International Great Lakes Datum, IGLD 2020, is officially adopted in about five years. The plans for IGLD 2020 were extensively discussed by Nicole Cruz in yesterday's opening session. Um, next slide. Low water datum is the zero level used for the navigational charts of each lake. When real time water levels are referenced to this datum, the value observed is the amount added or subtracted from the depths shown on the chart. Authorization depths for harbor improvements are also referenced to the low water datum and for the deepening and maintenance dredging of shipping channels. It should be a lake wide surface so low that the water level quote will seldom fall below it. One datum is defined for each lake and is interpolated within the internet interconnecting waterways. Next slide. <clears throat> the low water datum was established in 1933 and has not been changed since. Up until then, two separate levels were in practical use with the harbor improvement planes as much as a foot higher than the chart datum. The decision made in 1933 was to have a single datum to be used, used both for the navigational charting and for harbor improvements. The levels that were selected were a compromise between the pre-existing planes. In other words, the datums were not derived from a systematic method applied to the previously observed levels for each lake. Each lake's low water datum was defined relative to a specific benchmark at a master station on each lake. Pre-existing level surveys were used to assign lakeshore elevations relative to the mean tide level at New York City. When the International Great Lakes datums of 1955 and 1985 went into effect, the same low water datums were retained with lakeshore elevations being updated to mean sea level at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Next slide. Taking advantage of the upcoming IGLD 2020 update, the Vertical Control Water Level Subcommittee has been charged with re-examining the current low water datum level with possibility of suggesting any changes that might make sense. There now exist over 100 years of lake-wide average data available from the established network of gauges on each lake, including Lake St. Clair. Over the past century, the likelihood of occurrence of extreme low water periods might have been affected by the water level di water diversions, channel modifications, erosion, outflow, outflow regulation, and climate change. 
Next slide. <clears throat> These two plots show the monthly average lake level since 1918 relative to the low water datum for the upper lakes. Over 15% of the time during the past century, lake levels fell below the low water datum. This happened in 42 years for Lake Superior and 28 years for Michigan Huron. That does not meet the goal of setting a datum so low that water level, quote, seldom falls below it, and indicates that the low water datum should have been set even lower in 1933. Possible reasons for this might be subsequent changes to the superior outflow regulations and the deepening of interconnecting waterways. Next slide. <clears throat> These two plots show the monthly lake levels since 1918 for the lower lakes. Over the past century, the lower lakes fell below low water data less than 5% of the time in only nine years for Erie and 11 years for Ontario. Furthermore, these lakes haven't been below the low water datum since 1965. This raises the possibility of adjusting upward the low water datum of the lower lakes. Next slide. To further explore the frequency of low lake levels, we decided to compare the statistical extreme distributions of two sets of data. The first is simply the observational record over the past century. The second data set consists of modeled monthly means from the Coordinated Great Lakes Regulation and Routing Model, which is presently used for lake levels forecasting. The model was set up with the current configuration of the lakes and the existing outflow regulations in place. The model was run with the net basin supply time series collected over the past century as the model input. Next slide. <clears throat> These plots compare the observed monthly average lake levels in blue with the modeled levels shown in orange. The two plots on the left side show that during the first 50 years, the model results for the upper lakes, Superior and Michigan Huron, would have fallen even lower than the blue levels that were actually observed in the 1930s and 1960s. In, co in contrast, the comparison for Lake St. Clair in the upper right corner shows many large drops in the observed values in blue, which occurred in single wintertime months mostly in the first 50 years. These drops are not present in the orange modeled results. These low winter levels were probably caused by historic ice jams upstream in the St. Clair River. Ice jams likely became less fre frequent in the second 50 years due to the increased use of icebreakers. In the lower right corner, the Lake Erie model data comparison also shows that the low levels observed in the 1930s would not have reached such low levels under the present day conditions, according to the model results in orange. Next slide. <clears throat> An extreme value analysis assesses the probability of occurrence of events that are more extreme than most or all of the previous observations of a random variable. It is widely used in many fields, including engineering, finance, earth science, and hydrology. The generalized extreme value analysis makes use of a time series of the highest or lowest values in equal sized blocks of data, such as a one year period. Next slide. <clears throat> In order to find the lowest monthly lake averages for each year, the data is divided into 12 month periods beginning in July and ending in June. This prevents double counting of extreme low water months that could occur in December and January of consecutive years. 
the plot shows the annual lowest levels from the model results for Michigan Huron as orange dots. 37 of these annual minima fell below the existing low water datum shown in red. The GEV results give the position of the 90% annual exceedance probability level, which is shown in yellow. Next slide. This table presents our results from the extreme value analysis. The upper half shows the GEV results from the historical data. The columns of 85, 90, and 95% annual exceedance probability are given with respect to the low water datum existing, existing now. The lower half shows the results from the model data, also with columns showing annual exceedance probability levels with respe respect to the existing low water data. We are considering the 90% annual exceedance probability as a sensible choice to define the low water datum, which would result in lake levels going lower in only 10 years per century. For Superior and Michigan Huron, we can see that either observed or model data, the low water datum should be lowered by eight to 12 inches. Lake St. Clair's low water datum would only need a minor adjustment of about two inches if modeling results are used, which do not include the historical ice jams in the St. Clair River. Only mon minor positive or negative adjustments would be ne needed for Lake Erie and Ontario, whether historical observations or model data are used. Next slide. <clears throat> The largest change suggested by our results would be to lower Michigan Huron's low water datum by about one foot. What would be the consequences for nautical charts? The values on the contours and the maintained channel depths on the US or Canadian and the Canadian charts would have to be changed by one foot or 0.3 meters. However, such a change does not introduce any new depth restriction on shipping operations because water level gauge measurements relative to a new lowered datum would then be a foot higher than before. Next slide. Lowering the low water datum by a foot, however, would mean that the maintained channel depth would not as be as deep as the authorized depth. This diagram created by the Corps of Engineers shows that a channel authorized to be 27 feet deeper than low water datum would only be 26 feet deeper. Therefore, either the channel could be dredged deeper or the authorized depth could be adjusted to reflect the change in low water datum. Next slide. The Corps of Engineers have, have provided us with an example of a maintained channel where they identify areas that are currently within 11 inches of the authorization depth. This comparison shows areas that may need to be deepened in one section of the St. Mary's River. Next slide. So taking advantage of the planned IGLD update for all station elevations coming out in about five years, the coordinating committee is now considering whether to recommend any changes to the low water data. The next steps would be that the coordinating committee would put forward suggested values for low water datums for each lake. This will be followed up by outreach to impacted stakeholders over the next few years to determine how such a change would affect their interests. A final decision on making any changes to the low water datums will be determined by the coordinating committee. New values would then be published and converted to IGLD 2020 when it is released. Downstream products will then be updated to the new low water datum values. Next slide. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Chris. And at this time, we'll go ahead and ask if there are any questions for Chris in regards to his presentation regarding the low water data. And while we wait for questions to come in, Chris, I guess one of the questions I had, you know, looking at the historical uh, record, um, weather patterns. Um, you mentioned, you know, some of the evidence from the ice jams and, and icebreakers uh, with some of the low water dam values that you were seeing, or the water level values you were seeing. Um, but as to with the recent period of the large swing in water levels that we've experienced in the last decade or so in the Great Lakes, you know, is that something that the model can say, predict into the future? Uh, well, this model is set up with the um, current configurations of all the channels and lake um, lake levels, and it is um, under the current regulations for the uh, outflow requirements. Um, the um, the model doesn't have a um, the the models net basin supply is the historical levels that are um, evaporation, precipitation, uh, runoff, and also input and output for each of the, um, well, no, it's, it's the evaporation, uh, precipitation, and outflow um, up runoff for each of the lake basins. And um, the, um, the the model does not um, have a way of um, putting in ice jams into the connecting channels, as far as I as I as far as I know. Um, it is it is currently run as if the um, basically that you have liquid water in all of the connecting channels rather than ice. Right. I think the, this next question is kind of related to, to this. How does expected climate change impacts get a keen into account given historical data was somewhat uh, absent in its effects? Um, well, that's that's an interesting question because um, if you look at the, the long-term trend for over 100 years for the upper lakes, they're pretty much flat. There's no statistically significant trend upward or downward um lake erie has a statistically significant rise in water levels but i don't think it's known whether that's due to um, increased precipitation or um, reduced evaporation from lake erie um, and ontario has it, it does have a rise, but it's, it's the uncertainty is large enough that you don't. It, it's not really statistically significant. Uh, so there are possibility. Poss it is possible that the lower lakes are being affected by climate change in terms of precipitation and evaporation. But it could also be from uh, channel dredging and. Um, just the on, ongoing glacial isostatic uh, adjustment. So, yeah, there's probably further research that needs to be done into, into that. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm seeing any other questions come in at this time. Um, you just actually, one of the questions that actually based off your last comment there you know some of these additional research um, needs that you see related in better understanding water levels uh, I guess what are your thoughts on what additionally is needed to further refine um, it, you know again with the new datum uh, coming online and just thinking about the next datum after that uh, perchance uh, what additional research may be needed to, to improve uh, the modeling results uh, well, one of the one of the things that was discussed discussed in the uh, subcommittee meeting, one of the subcommittee meetings, was to um, to model the the next hundred years by including um, 
uh, including some climate change um, effects in the inputs that are going into the, the, the five basins, the basins of the five lakes, um, and see whether that could help us predict. That would, that would help us kind of get ahead. Instead of looking backwards to set the low water date and kind of predict where it's going to be in the next 100 years if, um, if there are going to be any major changes. So that would be probably an interesting um, exercise to, to do, but um, that would, I, I, think there's, I think there's some, some research groups that are looking into that. Um, fortunately, I don't have the name, the name of the person who was doing that. Um, I need, I, but I think someone is someone is, that there is modeling going on into that research subject as to what's going to happen to lake levels, you know, in the next, uh, you know, by running models for the next hundred years or trying various scenarios that might occur over the next hundred years. Yeah, that's in relation to some of the work that's being done between the Army Corps of Engineers um, as well as GLURL and the USGS, I believe, um, kind of in looking at some of that future weather uh, generation and future water levels uh, moving forward. We do yeah. have another question. Uh, yeah, to, to bring in those results and see what the um, where lake levels, like where low water datum would, would fall. We do have another question that has come in. Um, does the model take into account uh, consideration the ruling of Chicago diversion, uh, so the you know sending water down through Chicago uh, diversion case with regard to uh, the amount at the Chicago River and Lake Superior? So uh, in terms of those upper lake numbers and the Chicago diversion, does that uh, factor in at all? Uh, yeah, those those values are incorporated into the model as as a um, as a um, as a regular output from the uh, lakes. Perfect. And there's a few others, uh, inputs and outputs from uh, diversions. <laughs> 